Thank you, Gail. George, that was beautiful. <coughs> but of course, in Sunday school, somebody said about Gail singing, and she always does well. She does good. As obviously is aware, as our pastor is not with us this morning, and he's gone to a pastor's conference in New Orleans, and also he will stay then uh, for the SBC convention that will follow on, I think, Tuesday and Wednesday. And so there's some issues there that uh, they're going to address and they're going to vote on it and Joe Gentry has uh, been able to make arrangements that he will also be able to go down and be a messenger uh, on behalf of our congregation during this time. We need to have that in mind. We need to be praying about that. Uh, we also need to be praying for our church, for our community. But before I get into all of that, once again, I just want to say a word of praise uh, uh, for our VBS, for all who were involved. Uh, uh, just a word of appreciation for those who gave of their time for this past week. And again, a praise for three salvations, three young people giving their life to the Lord, beginning that walk with the Lord. And so, again, all I can do is just say thank you, Lord, for what you have done. As Gail sang, to God be the glory for all of that. Now, I also want to thank you parents who allowed your children to be a part. And I'm looking forward to next year and I guess the time in between because what God has in store only He knows. Now, to our message this morning, I... Uh, as you see in the bulletin, it, it's titled, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And I think about in past studies, uh, many times we get into situations that possibly could have been avoided if we had just sought the counsel of the Lord before we got involved with them. If we had just sought the counsel of the Lord, if we had just asked the Lord first and foremost instead of waiting to things kind of went south and then coming to Him to say, well, uh, okay, sorry, Lord, I messed up. Uh, can you fix this now? In the passage of Scripture, and, and it's going to be... Uh, Caleb's already got it up on the screen for us. At the end of this, uh, verses 9 through 13, we're all familiar with that portion of Scripture. It's a model prayer. Jesus says, this is an example of how you should pray. But I want to start with a passage in Scripture in Luke 11, which Caleb would not have, but if you will permit me, Luke 11, verse 1, the Gospels many times are parallel. Different writers writing about the same events, but yet because they are different writers, they are presenting and, and, and giving their own take as far as what happened or how they saw the same event take place. Well, Luke 11 and then uh, Matthew 6 are 
parallels in that one was written by Luke, one was written by Matthew, and each given their different uh, mindset or what they perceived to be uh, of that particular event. But this morning at Luke 11, it says, Now it came to pass, in verse 1, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now the he in this passage of Scripture is obviously Jesus. And Jesus was praying. His disciples were observing him as he was praying. And even to the point that one of the disciples when he deceased said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So when we look at this, we need to realize the importance of prayer to the point that not only uh, up to this point, John was teaching his disciples to pray or how to pray. And so his, Jesus' disciples says, uh, Lord, teach us to pray. I want to bring also to your attention that Jesus' words where he begins in this passage of Scripture that you see on the screen, that he expects us to pray. He expects us to have a prayer time with our Father because He says when you pray, He's not saying that uh, if you pray or should you decide to pray, but He says when you pray. And let me remind us all of all the different passages in Scripture where Jesus Himself set himself apart where he went away for a period of time so that he could have time alone with just him and the Father to pray. Now as believers, rather new believer or one who's been a disciple or follower of Jesus for a number of years, prayer is just like reading and studying God's Word as far as importance, and it must be a part of our daily or our spiritual nourishment in order to keep ourselves spiritually strong, keep ourselves in the center of God's will, and to help us know and recognize the wiles and the schemes of Satan, the devil. Being obedient to the Lord is the last thing that Satan would want. And you know what one of his greatest tools against the child of God is, and that's time. Time. I was thinking of that this morning. Time. There's always something else in this world vying for our time that we should be spending with our Father in His Word and in prayer. Now, much of these things that are vying for our time, we have to do. It's necessary. But none of us are exempt from this regardless of how long we've been true Christians. But some have developed a spiritual discipline, a discipline that's needed, that time with the Lord is a daily part of their lives, and it must become a discipline. It must be developed. 
It must become like a habit for us, a routine for us, a specific time set apart for that very purpose. And I'm going to tell you that I struggle with that. I struggle with this, and I'm like the disciple in Luke, and and I say to Jesus, Lord, teach me to pray. As also, as John also taught his disciples. Now, if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about as far as a spiritual uh, discipline or something that must be developed, Let me bring it or say it in this context. Those individuals, and I admire them, who want to keep their physical selves in the best shape possible, they develop a discipline as far as possibly diet and exercise, and if they're faithful and committed to that, there's a time set apart every day that they engage in that discipline, be it walking, running, weightlifting, whatever it is, it's a physical activity for the sole purpose of keeping their physical body in the best shape possible. That's a discipline that they have developed. It's a habit. It's something that has become their routine each and every day. It's a part of their life. Our prayer time with the Lord, just as our reading of God's Word, should be like that. Let's look at our passage of Scripture in Matthew 6, and I want to read down to... Uh, 6, uh, 5 through 8. And Jesus is speaking here and He says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, but you, when you pray... Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you you have need of before you ask Him. When we look at this passage of Scripture, the thing that comes out to me as I see that first of all is that when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. So we need to pray in a fashion that is sincere, genuine, real, authentic. Jesus says, and when you pray, again, He expects us to pray. He expects us to be genuine, sincere, and not like the hypocrites. Hypocrite, Marion Webster. Number one, a person who puts on a false appearance of virtue or religion. Number two, a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. One thing maybe I should ask or we should ask in this, in this first portion of Scripture, and which to me in regard to the, the practice of prayer, it seems that Jesus is addressing prayer at this point in more of a public uh, atmosphere or scenario. So 
when we just read this passage of Scripture, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I tell you that they have their reward. So what is your motive in this scripture passage? This individual that he, uh, Jesus talked about, standing on the street corner, standing in the synagogues, it's like, hey, here I am. Look at me. See what I'm doing? If that is that individual's motive, Jesus says they have their reward. And what is that reward? They were seen by men. That's it. That's their reward. Now, in the context of public prayer, I want two questions. For us, in public, do you pray longer or do you pray differently than you do in private? Do you pray in private at all? Now, I'm not condemning public prayer because prayer is a part of our worship right here and when we pray here as part of our worship to our father it should be presented to the Lord from a pure heart a pure motive and in such a way that uh, that it truly reaches to the very throne room of God But is public prayer for some of us, is it a mere formality or a ritual? That, that is what I want us to think about. Do we pray differently in public than we do in private? Do we have a set of words that we have taught ourselves that we go over and over and over these same words every time we pray in public and, and not truly coming from our heart? Just want you to think about that. Verse 5 again, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, it's for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Lord, teach us to pray. The next verse. Now, in this verse, verse 6, Jesus seems to be transitioning over to our private prayers. And so he's telling us that when we pray secretly, we're not in public, but it's secret. It's between us and our Father. And he says in verse 6, But you, when you pray... Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The Father will repay you. All right, again. But you, remember, it was a disciple of Jesus who came to him asking this question or request of, Lord, teach us to pray. So Jesus is responding to the disciple, the follower of Christ, to the child of God. 
He says, but you, not a hypocrite, hopefully, when you pray, again, when you pray, there's an expectation there. In this private prayer, go into your room and shut the door. All right? By closing the door, then in essence you're closing out the interruptions that seem to always come to us in, in our lives. You're closing, you're shutting out the world. You are, in essence, you're creating a place, an atmosphere where you are truly alone with God. Now, I confess, let me make this, and, and I'm the only one that deals with this, I know. None of y'all probably deal with it. I can go into my room, I can shut the door, I can be free from the distractions in my household. How do I shut my mind down when all a hundred different things seem to be crowding in? on me and I'm going to leave that question just as it is because I feel like y'all fully understand and I believe that in our prayer time if we just truly take that deep breath and just relax and allow the Holy Spirit to have complete control He takes all of those distractions, even those in our mind. And we develop, and it has to be developed, a time when we are in our closet, in our room, how it, it, and I'm not saying it has to be in that scenario. I think it can be anywhere. It's a place where we are alone with God our Father wherever that may be for you. And the thing is, even closing the door, shutting that door, He is there with us. Do we think we can close the door and God can't get in? God is there, even in the secret place. He is there. And He sees our hearts and He hears our petition. And as Jesus says, He will reward you. But you, when you pray, go to your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This is a private an intimate affair between you and our Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, when who we are in private and secret place. I want to let, let me, my tongue got tied behind my eye teeth back there. Let me say this again. Who we are in private or in secret is who we really are. The question. Who are you, what are you like when only God is watching? No pretense, just you and your heavenly Father. Going on, verse 7. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. When you pray, Jesus condemns the senseless, the, the mindless, rote inclinations and recitations that are more akin to paganism. Do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. 
I'm not going to read this passage, but I want to refer to your attention back to 1 Kings chapter 18. And in this passage, this is where Elijah, the prophet of God, and the prophets of Baal had their altercation, if you will, their time of where Elijah and they were going to determine who were the who is the true and real God. It is the God of Israel or the gods of Baal. And this is where they did the altars, the sacrifices, and, and for time. Elijah told them to go first. They were going to sacrifice a bull. They built the altar. And the prophets of Baal called upon Baal and all of that. And, and Elijah was even helping them along. You know, well, call a little louder. Maybe he's asleep. You know, maybe he took a trip. Maybe he's doing this. Maybe he's meditating. Mocking them. And then, through all of that, there never was any response from the gods of Baal. But when Elijah built his altar, he had water poured on it and all of this. And that portion of Scripture tells us not only did God answer, but he answered with fire. He consumed the altar. He consumed the sacrifice. He consumed all of the water that had been poured on that. So Jesus tells us, there is no need to babble. There's no need to heap up empty phrases. There's no need for vain repetitions. And as the example I was using, as these prophets of Baal were doing. Don't pray like a pagan, speaking uh, nonsense over and over. Many words do not equal either a uh, sincere prayer or a guarantee that you will be heard. God will not be manipulated by hounding him with silly and empty repetitions. In verse 8, Therefore, verse 7, remember, do not use vain repetitions. In verse 8, Jesus says, Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Your heavenly Father is not like this pagan or this little G God as I spoke of in 1 Kings. He is an omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient Father who knows the things you need before you ask Him. Isaiah 65, 24 says, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, as we close this morning, I want to remind us, teach us to talk to and with God our Father. Just like a child would talk with a loving parent. Let us talk to Him like the perfectly heavenly Father that He is. The One who loves us. The One who gave His Son as a sacrifice. The most common passage of Scripture and, and, and the one word in this in John 3, 16. God so loved that He gave His Son, His only Son, for all of us, each of us, every one of us. We must be able to have that relationship with our Lord. A spiritual discipline of reading and studying God's Word a spiritual discipline of being able to pray. Not just happenstance, oh, oh Lord, I'm in trouble, help me out here, I messed up again. 
but to be able, and I'm working on it. I want to do it. I'm working on it. To be able to have that discipline that there is a portion of my time in my life every day that it's just me and the Lord. Just me and the Lord. Teach us to pray. Vacation Bible School. What a blessing that was. What a blessing that these three young folks, the Lord allowed them to be born into His church and His kingdom. They set the example for us. The only way we can come to the Father is through Jesus the Son. Jesus the Son gave His life in our stead. And it's not the Father's will that any should perish. He's made the way. He's done everything. All we have to do is to realize that, repent of our sins, believe what He's done, believe in Jesus and accept by faith that perfect work that perfect sacrifice and ask the Lord, Lord, forgive me. I believe in Jesus, your son. He, I want him to be my Savior, my Lord. I want to give my life to you. People say it in different ways, but that's the gist of what the Lord requires of us to be born into his family, into his church. And we're going to give that opportunity right now. Jason, if you will. George. But develop that time of prayer with the Lord. Some call that what I just shared, kind of the sinner's prayer. Some have said that the Lord will not even hear a sinner until he makes that prayer. But I want you to stand now, if you will. These altars, these steps, front pews, whatever. If God is speaking to your heart, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning, please, Heed that voice. I'm here. I want to pray with you. If you're not comfortable with that, our pastor will.